Two. Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to the Indiana State Police Roadshow. I'm your host, Sergeant John Perrine, the Public Information Officer for the Indianapolis District. The Roadshow is brought to you by the Indiana State Police Alliance and Cops for Kids, a subsidiary of the State Police Alliance. You can find more information about our sponsor at www.indianasfinest.com. Sitting directly across from me, a very familiar face that spent a lifetime with the Indiana State Police, recently retired, and now the current communications director for the Indiana Department of Corrections. You've got it. Dave That's Burstyn. Right. John, thanks so much for having me back. And, and it's always a pleasure to be here and to get to see you and to get to see Ron and, and, and stay connected with the department. But uh, it, it's hard to believe uh, uh, it's been over 100 days since I retired. Wow. Uh, I, I uh, retired from the state police on June 14th and uh, took a long 48 hours <laughs> off and uh, then came, uh, came back to work in, in my position now as the uh, Chief Communications Officer for the Indiana Department of Correction on June 17th. And it's just been a whirlwind uh, of uh, activity. The folks at the Department of Correction have been so welcoming. Uh, everybody's been very helpful getting me acclimated. And I tell you, you know, we make fun of the, of the FBI and all their acronyms. Oh wait, I don't. No, I, I know the truth. Uh, but I'll tell you what, Department of Correction would put FBI to shame. They have so many acronyms. And I, I said, you guys are a little heavy on the acronyms. Let's let's just speak in normal language. Yeah, yeah. Not like we're trying to hide anything. Sure. It's but, like a new learning a new code, right? It, it, exactly so. But it, yeah. it's been a uh, it's been a good transition and uh, I'm, I I thank God every day that the opportunity presented itself when it did and that the transition was so smooth and that I uh, still have great friends at the state police and making new friends at the Department of Correction. You know, what, what I envision retirement being, and you probably this, is you're such so involved for so long and, and at the level that you were involved and then you step away for, for a little while and you look back, you're like, huh, look at that. It does still operate without me. Like, is oh. that, you know what I mean? That's kind of one of those feelings like. No, exactly. And I've told, it's funny you say that, John, because I, I've told the story before about, uh, I won't say the name of the airline, but it was a national airline. And they, uh, this person was the head of the, uh, of the pilots uh, uh, association. And they were on a big strike, and, and he talked about how his years of experience, and that if he retired, his airline would miss it. And he said one day he woke up and he realized, you know, if I quit because I'm disgruntled, my boss is going to tell his boss, he's going to tell his boss, he's going to tell the president of the airline, and that president's going to go hire another pilot. <laughs> yeah. So no organization is bigger, yeah. uh, is smaller than the people that work there. The organization's always bigger. It'll, it'll go on. I'm just glad that I was able to contribute what I did. And, I always feel like I could have done a little bit more. But, wow. uh, I think we all feel that yeah. way. And sitting next to, to Dave is a uh, longtime staple in Northeast Indiana, but you've seen him on the show recently. Uh, First Sergeant Ron Galvez uh, out of the PIO office at headquarters. Uh, kind of drinking out of fire hose still, but uh, he's four and a half, five months in yeah. and um, doing a great job. And we're happy to have you on the show. I appreciate it, John. Thank you very much for having me. You know, uh, to kind of piggyback off what Dave said, you know, for me, it's been, gosh, pushing five months now, a solid four months. And, uh, yeah, that fire hose is kind of the, the pressure's kind of backed off a little bit, but uh, you know, having people like Dave and John that are that are embedded here in, in Central Indiana to, to lean on, um, you know, that 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 goes both ways. You know, I got, came in here knowing I don't know everything, not having that attitude. Every day's a learning day. Every day's a training day, and so keeping that in mind and understanding where my limitations are and what I need to to learn, and like you said, what phone buttons to push to get information from. It's huge, and it's yeah. uh, still trying to get that figured out from time to time, but it's mm -hmm. been really good. It's been a tr fantastic oh, transition, and uh, family, my family and I have had the opportunity here in the last month and a half to move to the area, yeah. so that's been huge. It's yeah. been huge, so well, we love it. We yeah, enjoy it. I'm, I'm glad. And, you know, speaking of, of media and, and settling in, and uh, Captain got a – I still say Captain, not Harris, because you'll always be Captain. Well, God bless you. But anyway, he <laughs> got a call this morning. Uh, we had a big crash on I-65 that closed the interstate down, and – it was probably about 6.30 this morning, and I, I had spoken to him, and he said, you know, I got a call from a reporter. She said, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to call you 
or Rich Myers about this cash. <laughs> and he says, well, let me, let me give you some information here. That was really Call funny. Rich Myers. Yeah. Yeah, gotta go, I'm going to go by. That's what yeah, I said. Actually, call I should have done call that. I should have called Rich. I don't know. I, I, it, it, it was. It was 6.30, and I was sitting. Uh, I was at my favorite restaurant having breakfast before getting my day started. So it didn't bother me if you called, but it was just funny listening to the call. I said, you need to update your Rolodex. Kind of thing that she probably doesn't know what a Rolodex is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, but that but that was funny. Yep. Uh, so so what we're here to talk about today, and, and we know that that uh, the Department of Corrections deals with sex offenders, and and the registry is kind of handled by the sheriff's offices and the different counties, things like that. But you guys also do some things coming up on Halloween. Yes. Uh, I know that there's some anxiety and, and that about sending your kids out or even being out with your kids in neighborhoods where sex offenders might reside, they might work, they might be. So what are some things that you guys are doing to put folks at ease on that? But one of the things that people don't think about with the Indiana Department of Correction is that we have a parole division and we have, we have correction police officers, uh, CPOs. And what they do uh, with this time of year is they go out and they put out a notice to all of the registered sex offenders that are on parole through the Department of Correction and they have them report to different areas for, and they update all of the records associated, verify that they're following through with the terms of their parole, and they do it on, on Halloween. And that makes it uh, safer for the kids that are out because you, you aren't going to have, you know, m many of the people that, that are sex offenders, some are, the, most of them are following the program of what they're supposed to do, but you don't want to, to tempt them uh, unrealistically and have something happen and at the same time we, we aren't going to be putting a sign on everybody's door that says registered sex offender lives here yeah. trick-or-treat someplace else yeah. so we've got uh, you know, over 400 sex offenders statewide that are being uh, monitored in, in this fashion uh, in some of the more rural areas it's there's not a place for them to report to so in those locations the uh, parole officers coordinate with local law enforcement small city departments, sheriff's departments, and they are, they go out and they make unannounced visits uh, to a number of the registered offenders that it's too far for them to reasonably drive uh, where everybody else is meeting. Yeah, so again, I'm sure you, you have older kids now, but when mm -hmm. they're younger, mm -hmm. there's resources out there. Like if you're gonna go trick-or-treating in a neighborhood that's not familiar, which I, I wouldn't recommend. I mean, go where you're familiar, but uh, what are some resources out there that you know of where people could say, hey, I, I want to make sure this is safe from sex offenders? Sure, the one, the one is uh, in the Indiana Sheriff's Association's website uh, because you can click on any of the 92 counties in Indiana and find the, the, the registered sex offenders in those, in those counties and find out where, where they're registered to be residing and, and plan your, your activities therein. Um, but again, I think a lot of it goes back to you know, you got young kids, you're not letting them go out. Even in the large groups, there's got to be some parental supervision, uh, you know, monitoring yeah, where they're going and who they're interacting with and what have you. So uh, also there's a national database. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, you can Google those and they're, they're, they're fantastic resources. And there's a lot of information on there. So yeah. utilize those, the Indiana Sheriff's Association website especially. And something that's becoming more and more popular is towns and cities are deciding to celebrate Halloween on different nights, where if, if it's a Wednesday, Thursday night, they're moving it to the weekend. So uh, you find kids and families kind of town hopping to the trick or treat spots. So uh, th these resources are real important. Uh, is your program only on Halloween night or does it expand? You, you bring up an excellent point, John. It is, it is j just on Halloween where the mandatory report is where mm -hmm. people come in. Now we do work with the 60 uh, parole agents that are that are working with the local officials, and if there's a local area that they're doing their trick or treating on a night other than October 31st, we will work with them. Okay. Uh, but the key point, just what First Sergeant Gallo has said, is planning. Yeah, there's an age, and I would be remiss not to say this, that by and large nothing's going to happen. Right. Nothing, of course. Nothing bad. Of course. We're, we're, the, the data, the history, the, yeah. everything's there that tells us it's relatively We're safe. preparing people for the tenth of a percent of a right. chance that something would go wrong. And, and so people should not be unduly paranoid. But if you take your young children and you're in a group and you're with them and you're supervising them, things are going to be fine. Right. Uh, your teenage kids that are still doing, you know, when I say teenage, the 12, 13, 14, there's a period of time 
bring it on. I pretty much had grown out of trick or treating sure. by the time I was 14. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, you just follow those common sense safety points, mm -hmm. and, and everything will be fine. Yeah. yeah. And, and again, you know, common sense, safety, all that. But, you know, I know that even outside of what the state DOC does, um, the locals do things too with sex yes. offenders, and, and they maybe not man make them mandatory to report somewhere, but um, they have extra police, or, or you know they, they check, they know you know these things. But but I don't want to downplay what a sex offender registry covers because a lot of these folks committed hor horrific crimes, uh, yep. but also some of them uh, committed some sort of sex crime when they were. 18, 19 years old. They're now 45, 50 years old and still on the registry for some reason. Again, not trying to downplay the importance of it, but I don't want people to panic if they search on the internet and they see two sex offenders in a town that, that they should become paranoid because it's actually... Well, and you bring up a really key point, John, and that's the each year that the Department of Correction does this, um, it's mandatory. So we've got 400 people that are coming out. Those that fail to respond they have a warrant put out for a violation of the terms of their parole. Yeah. And each year, at most, it averages, well, let me ask you, how many warrants do you think we end up issuing? If you were to take a wild guess. Well, I mean, probably less than 10%, I would guess, but I don't know. About five to eight warrants. So it's, and, and of those, how many do you find are actual, intentionally trying to avoid the registry, or they just... Well, if they didn't, didn't do if they didn't out respond, of laziness or whatever. Everybody's got an excuse, you know. Yeah. I had to wax the dog. Uh, my, my cat's hair caught on fire. Sure. Uh, the, the reality is, they know what they need to do. For whatever reason, they choose not to. Every once in a while, there truly is a legitimate excuse, and that'll be worked out if that's the case. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I think too, sometimes in these communities, whether it's large or small, you know, it, I guess based on resources, what you see are the like the the trunk or streets you see these community groups putting on events in a safe mm -hmm. uh, centralized location for parents to bring or or guardians to bring their their small ones again yeah. it, because it's a safe environment and, right and, and parents and loved ones can feel confident you know that their children are going to be are going to be trick-or-treating safely you know it, it all comes down to to being a good responsible parent yes not turning your your kids loose to trick-or-treat to know who your kids are with, even if they go with somebody else's family, make sure that those families hold the same values and rules that you do about monitoring this this process. Because, you know, sometimes parents think of an eight nine year old who's familiar with their neighborhood is, is safe to turn them loose, and they're yeah. just not they're yeah. not prepared. Now I'm going to turn the tables on you because it just occurred to me amongst the three of us sitting here, there's only one of us that still has children of <laughs> trick or treating age. Yeah. So and it's always fun to end a conversation like this yeah. on a high note. How are the Parine kids going out for trick or treat this yeah, year? Yeah, well, um, my town does have a trunk or treat, mm -hmm. so so you can kind of go down, and that's where kind of everybody gathers. But we do still have traditional trick or treating as well. And uh, the town I live in allows golf carts, and, and we have a golf cart, so we'll put the kids on the golf cart with lights and glow sticks and and, and safe costumes, and we go to houses of people that we know. We we go around town. Um, it's not for us. It's not about seeing how much candy we can get. We like to visit with people. We like people to see our kids dressed up. People that we the know. Spirit, the fun of it. Um, and, and we take photos, and you know, and and we kind of have traditional places that we've gone every year since my boys were there. And, and so these people expect to see us. And expect. And so yeah, we just have a, a good time. Um, and, and then Dad raids the candy at the end of the night, and, and they pay the candy tax. And, um, and you know, I'm the one that had to drive them around, and you know, no, no, of course, no, no. Uh, but it's about safety and fun, and, and just sticking with what we know. So, uh, which son is going as a firefighter this year? Uh, hopefully, neither one, because <laughs> we did that a couple of years ago, and, and I, I still have nightmares about it. <laughs> what would Mike Pruitt say about that if he were here? You know, Uncle Mike would be pretty proud. I think uh, when when my boys dress up like firefighters, uh, but uh, we'll we'll try to steer them away from that, like I do every year. <laughs> did, did you either of you ever have a firefighter costume Halloween? Oh gosh! For, for your kids or my, yourself? You know, my son did. My son was, yeah. of course, a trooper, so I, you know, I was able to adorn him with certain yeah. things. But uh, yeah, there was a year that he was a firefighter. Yeah, yeah. Well, my son always wanted to be the skeleton. Oh, it's so, something yeah, scary. Yeah, yeah. He, he, yeah, he had the skeleton out of you know, yeah. the, the full yeah. body out one, so that that was his choice. Well, thank you very much to my guests, First Sergeant Ron Galvez and, and David Burston from the Indiana Department of Corrections. Uh, we've been talking about sex offenders, Halloween, um, and and just kind of 
trying to ease some of the apprehensions that people might have about what's out there, what the, the realities versus the myths and the and the perceptions. And so that's it's it's going to be safe. We we have the extra law enforcement out. These people are monitored, and it's very important that the parents stay up with where their kids are going and where they're going to be. Stay where you are. Thank you very much, Coach. Thank Joe you, is John. Out. Thank you, John.